So welcome everyone that you're still here on Sunday afternoon <laughs> after one and a half long days of a conference. For me, it's actually the first time here at Frostcon, so didn't really know what to expect. And it was definitely not the last time <laughs> that I was here, like it quite a lot. Uh, so um, that's also why like I completely changed my plan for the talk like maybe two or three times. So because I had no idea what to expect. <laughs> Uh, so probably what was in the description is not exactly how the talk is going to be. So some changes there. <laughs> but I, yeah, I hope that uh, it's going to be fun. Uh, maybe something, some interesting ideas, stuff that um, uh, you find entertaining. I don't know. So uh, the ti title is now a bit different. So it's a peak into static binary analysis because that's what we are going to take. <laughs> Um, maybe just uh, two or three sentences about myself. So I'm a researcher at Fraunhofer FKE, a PhD candidate. Uh, you probably know this uh, golf ball-like structure when you go hiking in the Siebengebirge. It's uh, pretty visible. That's our main uh, kind of uh, venue. And then there's the other one in Bonn, which is uh, where I sit. And I'm like in this uh, CAND group, especially in the uh, software and firmware security. And somebody really had some fun uh, finding nice acronyms. So uh, I, it took me like five minutes to realize how you can make the acronym safe out of that group name. But OK, <laughs> uh, having a nice acronym is always very important. Um, yeah, so that's like two sentences about myself. But what have we to do with open source? So we try to open source many of the things that we develop um, in our um, group. And so those are like the best of, of our open source stuff. So we've got FACT, which is a firmware analysis and comparison tool. So we are actually like the guys who try to reverse this process of people who create firmware and package it and ship it with devices. So we are mostly concerned with uh, getting the firmware off the devices and analyzing it. Um, so in fact, is automating a bunch of those steps, um, especially in the analysis stuff. Uh, then we've got FreeTab for like essentially um, intercepting TLS traffic of apps and stuff that use um, certificate pinning and things. It's quite popular there in Android reverse engineering. Um, Dwarf is pretty cool. It's a decompiler, so maybe literally just for me to get a feeling who of you has used something like a decompiler already. So just to get some idea of who's there. Okay, so probably then you know Binary Ninja, uh, and there's we developed an alternative decompiler which sometimes produces nicer uh, code than normal one, but that's subject uh, subjective. And what we are going to talk about is none of those. So we are going to talk about the CWE checker, which is um, essentially a tool for static binary analysis um, that I recently got the new maintainer of. So a colleague uh, <laughs> who developed it previously and uh, did the research there uh, left us, unfortunately. And I was the last one uh, left who knew Rust. So uh <laughs> <laughs> Typical. Uh, so I got the job of the maintainer. Uh, nice. But it also fits kind of well into my uh, other research that I do. As, as you can see, so I haven't uh, had that much time to contribute. So um, I'm always learning new stuff uh, myself when I'm looking at the code and also when I'm preparing the talk. Um, and of, all, of course, all of this would not have been possible without uh, colleagues and students who would put in a lot of work into this project. Um, so, what's the context uh, of things um, that we are moving in with uh, this research? So, earlier this, today there was a talk by Amir. He is not here. I don't know if, you, if many of you have been there. But he talked about um, like auditing, software auditing, essentially. Um, and in this context, also kind of those static analysis tools comes in. Um, there are, of course, there are different things that you could uh, focus on when auditing software. So essentially, we are here, uh, of course, in the security track, so auditing software for security issues. But um, there could be different things. Usually, um, the focus when, that we are thinking about when auditing is bugs and vectors. 
So um, those are two things that um, you can look for when auditing things. Of course, there are a lot of different things. Um, but that's what, the, what our static analysis focuses on. Um, yeah, so what's essentially like, what's the role that um, such tools play in the auditing process? I guess earlier today, um, I mean, I Amir mean, was not so much concerned like with the actual auditing process, more with like organizing it and uh, like conducting those or, uh, um, audits from a higher level. But when you are really sitting down and you want to audit some piece of software, it's usually like, a, um, an iterative process, so you've got different techniques, um, auditing techniques that you switch between. Some of them are of, um, are very manual, so just um, applying specific techniques when reading source code or reading um, binary code. But you, of course, also use stuff like dynamic analysis, fuzzing, static analysis um, as well. It is actually a pretty good read, so um, what I always recommend when people want to learn more about auditing is uh, Mark Doubt. Um, the art of, uh, art of Software Security Assessment. That's um, a pretty good reference. And what role static analysis plays in this whole um, process? Usually there are like some type of bugs that can be very reliably detected um, automa uh, in automated fashion. So that's um, where those come in. Plus, they can help with pointing out to analysts specific points in the code that are worth further investigation. Or in the over the course of an analysis, you kind of see some patterns in the software that you can abstract away and then write some tailored analysis within some framework um, that allows you to easily write analysis to capture um, those kind of project-specific bugs. Uh, and in this way, static analysis can cover a lot of code um, efficiently uh, without, um, yeah, and making such, uh, in some sense, um, can, can make audits more productive. And so we employ it as one part of our auditing process when we are looking at things. Um, right, th those are like some examples of static analysis tools, all for source code mainly. Um, uh, that are like to different levels. So some are really just um, abstracting patterns and some are trying to find deeper bugs. But as Amir said, like the really deep bugs, uh, you usually don't find them with static analysis. That's uh, where you need the manual auditing to actually understand the code, understand the software. And um, But yeah, static analysis is one cornerstone. That's, that's, a, that's like what we are focusing on with this tool. Um, yeah. So, like, why is it important? Not much to add. If you want to <laughs> learn more about that, I would recommend uh, watching Amir's talk for the like general um, motivation. On the other hand, um, you can say that unfortunately, not all this that this was focused on open source software. Unfortunately, not every piece of software that one might have a legitimate interest in auditing, because maybe it's fulfilling. Uh, critical function within your company or within your product that you ship to customers and you kind of uh, yeah are faced with the question uh, how do I actually make sure that this thing that I'm shipping to customers or that I'm integrating into my products is secure um, and in this case like auditing of binary code definitely comes in so yeah that's a nice example so <laughs> Uh, usually, uh, routers are something that we look a lot at, and unfortunately, there are some proprietary operating systems for routers, different ones, and you really don't have source code there. Um, so, the high level idea of um, the, the static analysis tool is essentially like we want to take in some binary, some program. We don't really want to have to know much about it, so we don't. We don't assume that we are able to run it or that we um, yeah, uh, know what it's doing, how to invoke it, what's its runtime environment that it expects, not even like what CPU architecture and so on. So um, it should be in this sense kind of practical and easy to use, uh, that it's not requiring too much input about the program to analyze. And then uh, optimally the output should be um, some um, warnings that analysts can look at. We implemented checks for something between 15 and 20 uh, CWEs. Who knows what a CWE is? 
it's essentially like an abstraction about common bug classes. So there are, um, it's um, common programming mistakes binned into um, um, yeah, classes like, for example, like buffer overflows, null point ID references, um, um, weak um, authentication or bypassable authentication. So, um, and for those different kind of bugs, there are spe uh, specialized analysis analyses which uh, then can be investigated. And of course, it should be kind of an ex extensible framework. So the goal is also to build something that allows you to quickly write new analysis uh, when you need them for a specific uh, task. So that's uh, like the idea that it's kind of a framework. Um, yeah, so why audit without source code in the first place? <laughs> uh, I guess I've already mentioned that there is proprietary software. The second thing is that, yeah, um, sometimes you should technically be able to get the source code for the devices that you actually want to audit, technically, because of licenses that demand it. But if you actually really try to get uh, the source code for um, some, I don't know, cheap IoT device uh, from the Far East, um, then you will notice it's not that easy. Of course, like uh, for, I guess for the German companies who are here, uh, for them uh, we have had no problems, but also we haven't looked much uh, at things of them in the past. But yeah, and also it doesn't scale well. Like sometimes you have to send a physical letter or so to the companies <laughs> uh, in order to be able to receive source code, and this doesn't scale well in analysis efforts. And uh, uh, last thing, like there is a subtle, subtle correspondence between source code and what's actually running on the devices. I guess most of you will remember this compression library recently. So that's what I mean. Like the correspondence between source code and uh, the stuff that actually runs on the device, there's a lot of magic happening in between uh, source code and uh, binary code. Um, some arcane build systems that are like twice as old uh, as me uh, that do interesting stuff that some people, uh, only very few people can parse. Um, so that's another reason to actually like look at, at the thing that really runs. Um, so there are kind of three broad problem areas that come up if you want to write uh, such a static analysis tool for binary code. So, or nah, I, these are the three that I picked out that I like wanted to discuss a bit in detail today. So, um, first thing before we can analyze anything, we need a representation of the program in some form that is amenable to static analysis. So, that's the first step that you actually have to do before you can analyze anything. Then there comes the problem that there's like a multitude of CPU architectures uh, that uh, the programs might be written in, especially if you go into the embedded uh, world. There are at least ARM, MIPS, PowerPC, maybe even um, other things, RISC-V, hopefully more in the future. We, have, we are not seeing that too much today. Um, and finally, like there is of course like a difference between designing static analysis for binary code and source code and you have to kind of deal with the fact that probably the program you're analyzing is not exactly what the programmer intended or what's actually the um, not um, what is actually like in the binary because like we, as we will see the recovery process uh, of program semantics is not that straightforward um, so let's start with the program representation it's like a short reminder uh, I guess it's helpful to illustrate some of the problems that you have when you try to reconstruct the semantics of a program from a binary to look at um, the process that actually generated the thing that we are trying to analyze. So this is more this is like something uh, more or less specific for a Linux build process for a user space program, uh, not especially applicable to everything. But in between, uh, like. The most commonly uh, known thing is, of course, the source representation of the program. Um, but it goes through a whole lot of transformation before it eventually arrives at the form that we want to analyze it in, that we have to start from. And there are some steps that are making our life harder, as, uh, especially like the optimizer is um, not a good friend of ours. Um, it transforms the program a lot, hopefully keeps it semantically equivalent, but certainly not um, equivalent in the yeah, syntax, it's a bit hard between languages, but um, yeah, so it certainly does some things that make our life harder. And in the end, there comes, of course, the code generation, which uh, leads to the many different CPU architectures and other things. 
um, maybe as a uh, last small step, just to illustrate how those things look like. So, for example, you familiar source representation of a program, everybody knows that. Um, but then it goes to the compiler, and every compiler has a bunch of different intermediate representations. So, for example, in LLVM, uh, we've got the LLVM and IR intermediate representation. And the compilers also do this because they can compile like programs from Rust and programs from uh, C or C++ in the same backend. So they bring it to a common form to this uh, intermediate representation. It's kind of a pattern that we are going to see again. So trying to bring it to a common form to have, because they also have to do analysis uh, and so on on this uh, on these programs and that's of course nicer if you know uh, like they are in normal form and then comes out some machine code that's um, specific for the architecture that you're compiling for so that's actually what happens if you compile the hello world i guess with o2 no no that's o0 uh, that's o0 of course uh, otherwise it would be a bit less code um, and then there happens some more things um, so you've got those assembly files, that's plain text still, um, but then comes the assembler and actually produces binary code out of that, uh, usually object files, cannot be executed, but um, um, they are kind of portable and you can build, uh, save them and use them later and so on. Uh, that, and then the linker is the guy who actually uh, takes a lot of uh, those uh, object files and puts them together to produce a program that you can actually run. It might uh, it might do some further optimizations, um, link time optimizations that um, could also um, impede the analysis process, but it's usually not so um, so bad. Um, yeah, that's essentially like you have got some uh, assembly files and out comes um, the binary code. So that's that's the stuff that we'll be working with in the end, just some uh, just some bytes. Uh, and that's where they get introduced. Mm. And then the linker adds a bunch of code and does a bunch of relocations and stuff, uh, but that's not so relevant. So that's the whole process. And in the end, we have got a um, program um, that's hopefully equivalent to what is originally written by the programmer, semantically equivalent. Um, and that's what we are starting from. So, yeah, essentially that's what we are starting from. Now, the first step that you have to do when you kind of want to understand what the program does is uh, reversing the assembler, the we could disassemble uh, the program. Uh, so how hard can that be is the question. <laughs> how hard can it be to reverse the assembler? Well, uh, here are some things that make your life hard when you try to reverse the assembler. First of all, somebody at Intel had the great idea that instructions can be arbitrary length. Um, or variable length, not arbitrary, I guess 15 bytes is the longest x86 instruction that you can write down um, at the moment. And um, yeah, the nice thing is that you can actually start executing them at any offset within instructions, and it usually makes sense uh, if you interpret just random byte sequences as instructions, so that can make your life harder. Then at some architectures, especially ARM32, you've got data together with code. Uh, which uh, g gives you the task of actually telling apart what is data and what is code. Um, yeah, and not to speak of the fact that you actually first have to discover in the binary what is actually code and what not. So in, in ELF files, you've got like some headers that tell you um, those offsets and sequences, this is uh, code and this is data. Uh, in other, if you've got like bare metal firmware, Nobody really tells you what of that is, uh, which of those bytes are code and which are data. Um, so, uh, and then, of course, like there are some nasty things like self-modifying code, code that uses overlapping instructions. Uh, it's abusing the fact that uh, you can interpret instructions from any byte. And, of course, not all bytes in the code regions are actually code. Some just are just padding for alignment and stuff. And all of those things may mean that the things you get, you, that you get out of the disassembler are um, not uh, making sense. So they're not essentially um, what, um, yeah, not related to any semantics of the program. Um, some things we really consider out of scope for our analysis. So we are not really uh, uh, assuming like obfuscation techniques. So things like uh, use of self overlapping instructions, self modifying code. That's usually th stuff that no normal program is doing. So that's things that malware is doing, uh, or other kind of code that wants to um, impede reverse engineering. 
you can still we still aim to detect it because it can be an interesting information that code is trying to do such things uh, is it of an independent interest because if you don't expect your code to um, your program that um, you're analyzing to use obfuscation techniques maybe there's something odd on odd going on so it's also relevant information uh, so I guess um, so. That's an example of stuff that can go wrong. Um, for example, that's um, inline data. The TBB instruction. Who knows that? Any ARM people here? One. Okay, <laughs> that's very good. <laughs> I, I didn't. Uh, I learned the hard way about it. So it's one of those things that make uh, life hard when um, dis de uh, disassembling thumb code on ARM. So it's essentially a jump table where the jump table is inlined into the code. So, and you don't cannot tell how big the jump table is. So in this case, it has three entries, and it's essentially like switching on the R zero register, and it's the offsets um, of the jump, like how far do you jump? That's um, what's encoded in those single bytes, but. Um, like without doing like a semantic analysis of the code, like usually there's a bounce check, for example, before um, such a TBB instruction to uh, check uh, that the index into the jump table uh, is within its bounds, and you can use that to infer its size. But that's uh, like non-trivial already, and if you don't, then you get some pretty meaningless uh, disassembly out of it, like some instructions that are not really there. Uh, second thing is, of course, that you can start interpreting c uh, code at any offset. So that's uh, some bytes, and if you interpret them at uh, as x86 code at different offsets, uh, what you get is always valid code. And uh, just trying to uh, chop the bytes into individual instructions can be a bit hard due to that. So one technique, like the most naive one that you could use when you try to disassemble a program, is just start at the first byte and interpret it as valid instructions. That goes wrong at some point, so who can see what's going wrong here? <laughs> yeah, essentially like the, the third instruction that we are looking at um, is a jump, three bytes onwards, but we are kind of ignoring that and after that, we, tr uh, we start disassembling nonsense because uh, <laughs> this is not what the program will actually execute. Those bytes will more or less be, complete, will be completely ignored when the program runs. And then we get like out of sync and we might be able to interpret those as valid instructions. But at some point, we are out of sync with the actual generated code and just get uh, and realize that because then comes some bytes that we cannot interpret as code. So that's recurs recurs That's why there are recurs uh, recursive traversals, so where you actually follow the control flow and that works. But of course, this can also go wrong. <laughs> so uh, that's an example of uh, an obfuscation technique called opaque predicates. So at runtime, EAX will be one. The test will fail. Uh, it will be non-zero. So the zero branch will never be taken and we just uh, do we just call this function but uh, if it if a recursive disassembler comes along uh, and takes the zero branch first um, well it's going to start disassembling at the first byte of the call instruction and uh, we get nonsense from there on and it, if it comes back to the other branch it will see that the bytes are already part of some instruction and just not consider them so um that's uh, that's why this is, that's why it's all, uh, just to tell you that it's already hard to get some kind of usable program representation out of a binary but let's assume that we actually solve that problem <laughs> so that we have some sort of program representation that we can work on and do our analysis with then we have uh, well the next problem that this is that we've got a multitude of cpu architectures that um yeah, and we want to, don't want to write uh, custom logic for all of them because in a, in the end, um, a static analysis has to know something about the semantics of the uh, code. It's always trying to capture a different part of the semantics of the code, but it has to uh, know at least uh, that much about the semantics of assembly to um, work. And for so many different architectures, this just gets out of hand. Uh, so that's more or less the problem. 
um, of uh, many instructions, a couple of thousand in x86, for example, across uh, too many CPU architectures, and implementing that by hand uh, in a small project is absolutely out of scope. Um, plus that some instructions are really complex, so if you look at like the x86 manual of, uh, of one of the not so standard instructions, uh, they can do a lot of stuff while uh, executing. Um, yeah, um, and essentially that's, we, we talked about the compilers also doing this, they have like diff many different source languages and many different target languages, and they try to go to some common form to have their code uh, kind of generic uh, over programming languages and target architectures, and the process of essentially reversing the code generation and the optimizer that's called lifting. Um, and yeah, the, the thing is, uh, every binary analysis tool defines its own way of lifting assembly to some common representation. So um, that's a collection of um, intermediate languages that are usually used by one or two binary analysis tools uh, that um, yeah, perform their analysis on them. And of course, um, there's uh, we also contributed to this problem. So, <laughs> but of course, it was completely necessary in our case. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> Um, but we, we tried to be not too bad, <laughs> so we based our intermediate representation at least off of something. So we based it off uh, Jidra. I don't know who knows Jidra. It's developed by our uh, good uh, supervisors from the NSA. Um, so we can at least be sure that this dependency uh, is certainly uh, going to be maintained. Um, the good thing is, at least it's um, it's open source, so you can uh, look for backdoors if you want to. Mm. But it takes a lot of steps, like all of those problems that I uh, that I outlined earlier. It has some solutions for them. Of course, it's not perfect. They are always trade-off. It's like uh, it. It's never perfect. If you roll your own disassembler, that's also not really an option. So you have to rely on something, and at least that's the thing that's open source. Um, other other people rely on Binary Ninja or um, Ida, which uh, both are not open source, and we can at least. Uh, it helps me quite often to look at the source code of uh, uh, Jira to figure out what's going on. Um, then we. Tr uh, bring it into a form of our own intermediate representation. Essentially, like there are some things that you want to have of your um, program that make it easier to um, be uh, aesthetically analyzed. So stuff like if you have like RAX and a sub-register of RAX, yeah, if you assign to the sub-register, it of course changes the value of the other register and, and the other way around. And if you have that as separate entities in your program representation, it gets a lot more complicated to analyze because you have to track those relationships. So we are do, doing some kind of normalization uh, to uh, disjoin the registers and we translate it to a certain normal form. Um, and actually, Picode is uh, like the intermediate representation of Jita is terribly inconsistent. So uh, <laughs> you could never execute a program uh, with uh, there are like branches to stuff that doesn't exist, uh, functions that simply uh, end in some void. And we try to normalize that to have um, to have an analyzable representation. And then after that, uh, Picode is very verbose. So um, it blows up your program size uh, quite considerably, especially because it makes explicit all those operations that are happening in the background when you have got some complex instructions. It makes all of that explicit. Um, and so in that sense, uh, we do the classical compiler optimizations, essentially, just to get the code size down by 50% sometimes to um, <coughs> save time in the analysis later. Um, so, for those who haven't seen it, that's actually what P-code looks like. So, yeah, I kind of like it quite often uh, during reverse engineering because 
who remembers what it means that the exclamation mark is at the end of the STP instruction. So it has, of course, an effect that I guess it's um, subtracted first and then stored. That's the, the meaning. Um, but we can very explicitly see that in the uh, P code. So we don't have to remember all the, uh, the whole ARM manual. Uh, to actually um, um, understand those instructions. So that's why it's sometimes useful. And we can see um, that it's also making stuff like the setting of uh, flags. Um, if you do like an addition, it sets certain uh, internal CPU flags and it makes that explicit um, in the representation. And so that's what uh, we are building um, our, our analysis on. Yeah. So in this case, nothing really changes. So that's just uh, the P code uh, translated to IR, IR. And here we can see that a bunch of uh, redundant thing uh, stuff can get thrown out. That's not too much. It's essentially just uh, copy propagation with the dead variable elimination, which is killing a bunch of assignments to flag registers and so on that will never get used. Um, so now we have some kind of representation. The last thing that we need is uh, actually defining analysis on this uh, on this representation so now there are some things which make our life harder so i already hinted at that the optimizer is kind of our biggest enemy <laughs> uh, so some of the things that make it nice to reason about source languages that are gone at uh, gone by now is for example type annotations generally typing uh, of the source language, which can help a lot when analyzing, and also things like type definitions, like structures, for example. So organizing data into some uh, form that makes it easier to, um, yeah, to reason about it. Um, all of that's, of course, gone by now. We just have memory and uh, bytes, so no types. We can, of course, still try to um, develop some kind of typing and there are of course many static analysis is also around untyped languages um, that you can do and you can to, uh, try to do type inference and uh, for untyped languages and um, do your static analysis like that. Um, of course the whole concept of variables is more or less gone. Um, things like function parameters, that's actually interesting because of course there is like a, a calling convention for the architecture that you have. So in principle, you could think that stuff like function parameters would not be lost, but um, in practice, it's actually, it's uh, generally not possible to precisely determine like how many parameters has a function. You can make upper and lower bounds based on different heuristics, but um, the number of function parameters uh, is in principle undecidable and also things like for internal function calls, in the compiler is not really forced to use CPU calling convention. It could get funny ideas for internal functions that are never address taken to uh, develop its own con uh, calling convention. It's, I guess for C it's not really not the case, but I haven't looked at Rust, so they at least um, claim uh, that like the, the AVI is not stable at all. So. Um, they already have like the problem of where to look for function parameters and so on. Uh, the whole concept of function, the compiler might decide to uh, combine two functions in parts. So, uh, for example, if two functions have the same ending, the compiler might decide to just uh, have two different entries and they meet together in the end or just completely inline functions away. Um, same for loops. They can be unrolled um, if the compiler decides that it's better um, or it might actually transform structured control flow which is like while if um, if then else statements uh, into unstructured control flow which is go to's and that's what harder to reason about uh, assuming that the programmer was not already doing a weird unstructured control flow with go to's um, yeah so that's more or less it so then we come to the static analysis part um, that we now have to deal with, with all of those problems. So there are different, let's say, reasons why you want to do static analysis. Mm. And those different uh, motivations come with different um, 
limitation, uh, different demands for the analysis. So you could try to verify or prove some properties about programs. That's usually like formal methods. You try to, um, I, I sometimes think of like Rust borrow checker as a program verification. So it really, uh, if it, it tries to prove that this program is satisfying those certain lifetime rules, and if it cannot prove it, the program is rejected. So that's really, uh, if it is able to prove it, then that's a proof and um, the program has those properties. Um, another reason for stating that is, of course, compiler optimization. So you can uh, optimize code better. We have already seen a couple of those because we do them ourselves. But if an expression, for example, in a loop is um, not changing, not depending on the loop, you can just uh, uh, loop, move it out of the loop or it's like code motion stuff. And then, of course, you can also do static analysis for program comprehensions. We all know, love this in our IDEs so that an IDE can tell us uh, where a function is called or where variables are used. Um, or do refactorings like inlining a function uh, into all its use sites. That's also static analysis. Um, and we yeah, are testing. Uh, we can also do like automated tests with static analysis, like can this assert assertion here fail or not? Um, yeah, but we are, what we are after is like the use case for static uh, for bug detection, of course, and this has certain implications for. Uh, for analysis. So, and like fundamentally, I probably some of you uh, know Rice theorem, which says more or less that any uh, observable property of a program, uh, I/O property, uh, semantic pro uh, any observable semantic property of a program is undecidable. So it essentially means we can stop here. So static analysis is absolutely impossible. Um, Beside the fact that uh, static analysis, like it doesn't rule out approximations, and so and as static analysis will always be some form of approximation to the program behavior. And the thing is that for different domain-specific tasks or different environments, you can always try to design a better static analysis, which uh, brings us to the uh, full employment theorem for static analysis designers, which means that uh, there's always some room for a better analysis in this and this aspect also in this domain. Yeah, usually you've got the typical trade-offs in your analysis that you also have with like any other algorithm. Uh, so you sometimes want it to terminate, you don't want to use up uh, too much space and it should be kind of useful and for, for us, like if we design analysis for bug detection, it's usually um, people will stop using static analysis tools that report bugs, uh, false positive rates exceed some threshold, um, sometimes it's cited as like 50%, so then people just find it less useful. And of course, it should be fast enough to be integrated into some um, into the processes that um, people are actually using it. And so, I mean, there are companies using static analysis that are okay with it, have, with it running for days and on big servers. And if you look at the stuff, for example, that Google is doing in static analysis for Chrome, uh, they are they've got like big clusters, and for days they run uh, some tools on that, and that's no problem. But if you just have like um, Interactive workflow it should be kind of fast. Um, now, there are two words that often come up when you talk about static analysis. Uh, our properties of static analysis is that's soundness and completeness. They're kind of dual to each other. You can show all of that in a formal mathematical sense, and you can also define what they mean in a very uh, formal way. So informally, a sound analysis is one that uh, tells you maybe too many facts, uh, but certainly includes all the ones that are true. So if you make a prediction about the range of a variable, it's certainly sound to say that it's within 1 and 10 if it could really only be within 2 and 5. That's a sound. That's a sound statement. And you usually want that for things like program verification and optimization, because if, you, if the borrow checker would let uh, through a program that's uh, ill-behaved at runtime, that would be bad. Uh, and also if the compiler would do some optimizations uh, that um, change the semantics of your program, that's bad as well. But if it misses some, so that's not, that's not too bad. Um, on the other hand side, you've got completeness, so that's more or less saying 
every statement that the analysis makes is true. So it would be perfectly okay to say that all possible values of this variables are five if they are really like three to five. At le um, and that's, for example, if you do testing and you ask the question, can this assertion fail at runtime? Uh, you usually want your analysis to only say yes when it can actually fail, otherwise your tests, your automated ones, will, re will report like spurious failures and that stuff. Uh, and for bug detection, it's actually neither of those. We don't care about this. So uh, <laughs> we are completely, we are soundy, some people say, so our analysis is incomplete and it's unsound. So, but that's the trade-off that I mentioned. So we want to um, not report too many false positives uh, and not run for too long. So uh, we have to make trade-offs in both directions and try to balance it well. And it's not too bad. I mean, in the first case, we are missing some bugs uh, and maybe reporting some false positives. That's both acceptable. And of course, you don't want refactorings to break your code. So please, uh, uh, <laughs> the, the, the analysis by uh, like IDEs should be both. Um, that's why they mostly do like stuff that can actually be done, like about syntactic properties uh, of the program, like variables and such and so on, like well, um, variable renamings and so on. That those are not so much semantic properties, but syntactic properties, and they can be solved exactly. Um, yeah, so there are many different ways to write down a data flow and um, uh, static analysis. Um, the, the CWE checker is mainly just data. It's just data flow analysis. So that's one way uh, of specifying uh, static analysis. And um, one abstract interpretation is a way of um, writing them down more formally in a way that um, you can. It's easier to prove properties about them. Uh, so sometimes we use this language as well. But I can tell you that none of those of those. Uh, checks that we have has actually approved that it's correct and we know of course that of many of them that they are unsound and that such a proof couldn't exist because we make trade-offs. Okay, so how do you um, write down a data flow analysis? <laughs> <laughs> uh, data flow analysis operate on a program on a control flow graph. I don't know, that's uh, a representation of a program where um, like instructions that are sequentially, that just fall through, they are grouped into blocks, and if you have like branching control flow um, or jumps, then uh, you insert edges into the graph. And our representation is kind of special. Uh, we have the semantics that every edge uh, corresponds to execution, and uh, nodes are points in the program uh, where nothing happens, so that's why we split basic blocks essentially in two, but that's uh, that's uh, only us who are actually doing that. <laughs> kind of confusing for new contributors. Um, then you need some kind of property space for your analysis. That's what actually entails which kind of program property you want to capture in the analysis. So, um, for example, if you want to capture all variables uh, that are alive at some program point, so alive means uh, they are read before they are reassigned, then your property space would be like the power set of all uh, of the set of variables in the program. So the property that you're computing would be some set of variables that's alive at a point. So that's the second thing that you have to choose in an, uh, when writing down an analysis. Uh, last thing are transfer functions. They are actually capturing what the program is doing. So they are capturing the effect uh, that, the, um, that the program statements have on the on the um, on the properties, so it's like we pick out some property that you're interested in, and then you reason about how do the individual statements of my language change this property, and that's really all you need to uh, then be able to compute it. Okay, you need some initial state uh, usually, and then you can run the analysis and get uh, the properties for for the different program points. And that's really all, like all of those uh, 20 uh, something uh, uh, checks for CWEs that we have, they are all just based on such a data flow analysis with different property space and different uh, transfer functions and all of that. And this way you can also, there's a framework around this, uh, which um, you can then use to implement new ones. So if you have some idea for a new data flow analysis, uh, that's all abstracted away. You can uh, define some types. Um, 
that are usually then representing your analysis, then they've got a couple of traits um, that provide you uh, an interface to, imp to define the transfer functions and the property spaces of this analysis. So um, say you want to um, yeah, just have some idea, or want to analyze something, then you can do this rather easily with library. You can write down something like easy analysis in, uh, under 100 lines of code in Rust. Um, that's really all you have to do to define uh, your own ones. And um, then you can run a computation and uh, get the minimal fixed point solution. That's our algorithm at the moment. <laughs> and we are, there are, of course, like many other, uh, other optimizations that one could do uh, if the data flow problem has certain properties and so on, like uh, more efficient algorithms. Um, yeah, so that's more or less uh, it for the static analysis. If you want to have some uh, application cases where this might be relevant for you, you can check it out. And yeah, uh, thanks a lot for coming. Uh, <laughs>
check if the path is actually feasible that led to this bug. And after that, we had like 50% uh, false positives for the use after freeze and double freeze. Uh, before that, uh, with the analysis, it was uh, something like 80% false positives. So uh, that's just to get an idea of uh, the false positive rates for this specific check. Um, and it also varies quite widely between checks. So there are some where I would say that they are very precise. So something like unchecked return values, that's an uh, analysis that's uh, very precise. So there are f few false positives obs observed, but more complex things, which like buffer overflows and uh, use of trees, and it's more like 80% false positives plus. Yeah. At the moment, there are about 20 CVEs uh, in the tool available. Um, what is your prognosis? What do you think will be the next step in, in the next years? Uh, will there be uh, 20 more CVEs in the next year? Mm. What do you think? So, of course, like the maintainer has changed and other maintainers have different uh, focuses. So for me, it would be more um, making it better because I think 80% uh, false positives at such checks not really uh, acceptable. So for it being useful. Uh, and so I would work on making the analysis more precise, essentially. So um, we have been, we've seen that symbolic execution can um, help a lot with bringing down false positives. Um, but there are, let's say, problems with the uh, tool that we used for doing it. It's anger. It's what everybody uses for symbolic execution. It has a lot of problems. Uh, for example, that it, that it supports only x86 and ARM, is effectively, and uh, <laughs> we want to uh, support. We want to have more. And so, uh, one thing is about thinking, rolling our own symbolic execution in there, uh, which is more adapted to what we want. Uh, um, because we don't need like all of those options that Anger offers, we just want uh, our under constraint symbolic execution on the our intermediate representation, and that would make analysis a lot more precise. So that would be one direction that I'd like to go in. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, when it comes to the assembler, the output is really unstructured. For example, that the jump table is uh, seemingly in an arbitrary position. Do you know if there's like a logical reason for it, like performance reasons or? Um, yeah, the jump table follows exactly after the instruction. Oh, so okay. S uh, but you just don't know how m how many bytes of the ones that follow the instruction are actually the jump table. <laughs> so that's uh, that's the kind of problem why. Uh, your naive disassembler is left guessing after seeing this instruction. So you would have to do some kind of data flow analysis of the code before the instruction to get an idea uh, of the size that the jump table might have. So, of course, it's possible, yeah. Further question? Um, sorry. Um, I wonder if your tool um, is also resilient against some positively ob um, applied obfuscation techniques. Um, oh, for yeah. example, canaries, um, there are binaries. Um, because you mentioned um, obfuscation techniques mm. are excluded. So, yeah. have you those also? I mean, Please. with positively um, applied obfuscation. Um, and the reverse engineering yeah. part, for example, ProGuard. Yeah, is, that is stuff or? is pretty much the same that malware uses. So it's, uh, I mean, those uh, there are tools, commercial tools that you can apply either to the binary level or to, or in the build process that uh, uh, people use for intellectual property protection mostly. Uh, that also essentially it's the same things that the malware authors use to obfuscate their code. Sometimes they even submit it to the, their malware to the same vendors that do this obfuscation and that's out of scope really for us. So um, yeah, we assume that the program is normal. <laughs> okay, but um, yeah. for example, if you know it only for interest, um, Flutter engine, for example, have it in built, built in. 
um, a Flutter engine. So you mean have some this, odd? Have this um, libraries built in. So it's, okay, not maybe a, it's not a malware, but we can talk about it. So it yeah, was uh, my question because um, then it can, could not be applied. So right? Some parts of the Windows kernel are also obfuscated using Microsoft's internal tool. Like there are some patch guard, for example. That's, I mean, there is a legitimate reasons for uh, obfuscating your code even more. <laughs> uh, yeah, I see that. Okay, <coughs> so. No more questions? Good, thank you.